When most people think of the United Nations, they think of an intergovernmental organisation established in 1945, the aim of which is to pursue world peace and promote human rights for all. Sure, the UN isn't perfect, but it at least represents some attempt at bringing countries together so that problems can be thrashed out through dialogue and negotiation rather than through violence and bloodshed. But when Jehovah's Witnesses think of the United Nations, rather different ideas come to mind. They are taught to believe that the UN is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and not in a good way. They consider it to be a sinister manifestation of satanic influence over world leaders in the build-up to Armageddon. This is the book, Revelation, its grand climax at hand. It was first released and distributed in 1988 when I was eight years old. It has since gone out of print and is no longer available on JW.org. And for good reason. There's really no polite way of saying this. It's completely bonkers. The Revelation Climax book is basically an attempt at shoehorning the events of the 20th century, especially the early beginnings of the Witness Movement, into the apocalyptic narrative of the Bible book of Revelation. Cataclysmic events such as burning mountains being hurled into the sea, great earthquakes or bowls of divine anger being poured out are all attributed as being symbolic foregleams of witness conventions, resolutions, books, pamphlets and magazine articles. Jehovah's Witnesses are presented as God's persecuted messengers whose fearless preaching work angers false religion and Christendom in particular, sending it spiralling into destructive turmoil. Enraged by their steadfast loyalty to Jehovah, Satan uses his influence over Earth's rulers to bring about the destruction of organised religion, which is revealed as being the infamous harlot of Revelation, Babylon the Great. With false religion destroyed, Satan then turns his attention to annihilating the only true religion on earth, you guessed it, Jehovah's Witnesses. But the moment Satan directs his forces to rally against God's true people, this heralds a cataclysmic event called the Great Tribulation, which ushers in Armageddon. And rather than being a Bruce Willis movie, a nuclear war or a devastating asteroid strike, Jehovah's Witnesses view Armageddon as the final standoff between God and the world under Satan, in which, spoiler alert, everyone who doesn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness gets massacred. In this grim narrative, the United Nations plays a significant role. It is unveiled as the scarlet-coloured wild beast of Revelation, the political instrument used by Satan to destroy religion. Not only do Jehovah's Witnesses believe the UN to be a pawn under satanic control, its very existence is considered to be an insult to God. This is explained in the following quote from the Revelation Climax book. The UN is actually a blasphemous counterfeit of God's messianic kingdom by his Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, to whose princely rule there will be no end. And this 1989 Watchtower quote spells things out even more clearly. Ascribing to human organizations things that God's kingdom alone will accomplish is blasphemous. Thus, the Bible foretells that after a short existence, the United Nations will go off into destruction. Only God's perfect heavenly government can bring lasting peace to mankind. In short, the reason the UN is so loathed in Jehovah's Witness literature is quite simply because it sets out to do everything that Christ's kingdom is supposed to do. It aims to bring people of different languages and cultures together in pursuit of peace and unity, 
and when it comes to that sort of thing, there really is no room for competition. By trying to tackle the world's problems, the UN is blaspheming God himself. With all this resentment, ill will and doomsday paranoia, you would expect the very last thing Watchtower would want to do is approach the United Nations with the purpose of establishing any kind of collaborative partnership. But you would be wrong. On October 8th, 2001, The Guardian newspaper published an explosive article by Stephen Bates, revealing that, despite its fiercely anti-UN teachings, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was actually registered with the United Nations as a non-governmental organisation, or NGO. Bates wrote, the United Nations is being asked to investigate why it has granted associate status to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the fundamentalist U.S.-based Christian sect, which regards it as the scarlet beast predicted in the Book of Revelation. Disaffected members of the Six Million Strong Group, which has 130,000 followers in the U.K., have accused the Witnesses' elderly governing body of hypocrisy in secretly accepting links with an organization that they continue to denounce in apocalyptic terms. The UN itself admitted yesterday that it was surprised that the sect, whose formal name is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York, had been accepted on its list of non-governmental organizations for the last 10 years. At this point, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you might be thinking, whoa, there's no way this journalist can be telling the truth. Watchtower would never get involved with the UN. Well, in 2001, lots of Jehovah's Witnesses reacted with similar astonishment. In fact, the United Nations was quickly inundated with phone calls and letters. Here is one of several official written responses from the UN directly addressing the issue. It said in part, Recently, the NGO section has been receiving numerous inquiries regarding the association of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York with the Department of Public Information. This organization applied for association with DPI in 1991 and was granted association in 1992. By accepting association with DPI, the organization agreed to meet criteria for association, including support and respect for the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and commitment and means to conduct effective information programs with its constituents and to a broader audience about UN activities. Two things from this letter will immediately stand out if you're a Jehovah's Witness. Firstly, notice the dates. Watchtower applied for association in 1991 and was accepted in 1992. This means that within three years of the Revelation Climax book being released, with its scathing denunciation of the UN as a blasphemous counterfeit of God's messianic kingdom, Watchtower was lining up to be an NGO associate. Secondly, notice what was involved in being associated as an NGO. Watchtower was required to meet certain criteria including support and respect of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and a willingness to conduct effective information programs on its behalf. Long story short, in 1992, Watchtower climbed in bed with the very organisation it had long demonised in its literature. But within hours of the whole thing being exposed by the media, Watchtower wasted no time in quietly making a stunning U-turn. As mentioned, the Guardian article went out on October 8th. Within 24 hours of the article being published, Watchtower requested that its NGO status be terminated, as the following letter from the UN confirms. In October 2001, the main representative of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York to the United Nations, Jiro Alicino, requested termination of its association with DPI. Following this request, the DPI made a decision to disassociate the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York as of 9 October 2001. Such a hasty retreat was hardly the sign of an organization unashamed of its actions. 
Watchtower had been busted and it couldn't untangle itself from the UN fast enough. Even more suspect was the total information blackout that followed. I am now speaking to you in 2016 and as of now, no Watchtower magazine article or public statement has ever addressed the organisation's nine-year association with the UN or the reasons behind it. And this strategy has worked brilliantly because to this day, the vast majority of witnesses remain completely in the dark. It wasn't until 2011, 10 years after the Guardian article, that I finally learned about the scandal. And that was only because I had consciously given myself permission to start doing objective research online about the religion of my birth. At this point, you might be wondering, just what is Watchtower's excuse for all this? They may have never publicly acknowledged the scandal, but surely they responded in some way. Yes, they did, but you are only supposed to know their response if you worked at The Guardian in 2001, or if you were one of the branch committee members that were sent letters by a governing body that was desperate to save face in front of its subordinates. So, what excuse did Watchtower give? First, let's take a look at a letter sent to all branch committees dated November 1st, 2001. Dear Brothers, Because of published allegations by opposers that we have secret links with the United Nations, a number of branches have inquired about the matter and we have replied. This circular letter replaces any replies we have given earlier and is sent to all branches. To anyone inquiring within your branch territory, you might respond according to what is stated below. Our purpose for registering with the Department of Public Information as a non-governmental organization in 1991 was to have access to research material available on health, ecological, and social problems at the United Nations Library Facilities. We had been using the library for many years prior to 1991, but in that year it became necessary to register as an NGO to have continued access. Registration papers filed with the United Nations that we have on file contain no statements that conflict with our Christian beliefs. Moreover, NGOs are informed by the United Nations that Association of NGOs with the DPI does not constitute their incorporation into the United Nations system, nor does it entitle associated organizations or their staff to any kind of privileges, immunities, or special status. Still, the criteria for association of NGOs, at least in their latest version, contain language that we cannot subscribe to. When we realized this, we immediately withdrew our registration. We are grateful that this matter was brought to our attention. We trust that the above is helpful in counteracting the attempts of opposers to discredit us. Please be assured of our warm Christian love and best wishes. Your Brothers, Chairman's Committee. Now let's take a look at the letter to the editor of The Guardian sent by Paul Gillies at the UK branch dated October 22nd, 2001. Dear Sir, Stephen Bates' articles in The Guardian of October 8th and 15th substantially misrepresents the background to Jehovah's Witnesses' registration with the United Nations and contains a number of factual errors. In 1991, one of our legal corporations registered with the United Nations as an NGO, non-governmental organisation, for the sole purpose of getting access to the extensive library of the United Nations. This enabled a writer who received an identification card to enter their library for research purposes and to obtain the information that has been used in writing articles in our journals about the United Nations. There was nothing secret about it. At the time of the initial application, no signature was required on the form. Years later, unbeknown to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, the United Nations published criteria for association, stipulating that affiliated NGOs 
are required to support the goals of the United Nations. After learning of the situation, our membership as NGO was withdrawn and the ID card of the writer was returned. Sincerely, Paul Gillies. Already we see a noticeable contradiction between the two letters. When writing to the branch committees, the governing body's chairman's committee said they were grateful that the matter had been brought to their attention. Since it was Stephen Bates at The Guardian who brought the matter to everyone's attention, you would think any sincere gratitude would be best directed to him personally. Instead, Bates's editor gets a scathing letter from Paul Gillies accusing him of misrepresenting matters. But that aside, how does Watchtower explain its involvement with the United Nations? And how do these explanations square with the facts? Firstly, according to Watchtower, they applied for NGO membership to gain access to the Library of the United Nations. Apparently, being an NGO member was the only way this was possible. Secondly, the requirements in the 1992 UN registration papers were said to not conflict with Watchtower beliefs. Only later, we're told, did the requirements change so that they became objectionable, including a requirement that NGO members support the goals of the United Nations. When Watchtower found out about this through The Guardian, they withdrew their association. Thirdly, no signature was required on the application form. This last point, brought up by Paul Gillies in his letter to The Guardian, is plainly irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether the application forms required a signature or not. Indeed, 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses are currently in an indefinitely binding pledge to the Watchtower organisation, with grave punishments for revoking it, without ever having signed anything. What matters is what was involved in meeting the registration criteria and whether Watchtower entered this process aware of the requirements or not. This brings us back to the second argument and begs the question, what were the requirements for joining as an NGO in 1992? The answer really depends on whether you're prepared to take the word of the United Nations or not. You might remember the statement issued by the UN when the story first broke in which Paul Hofel, chief of the NGO section, said that the criteria for association included support and respect of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and commitment and means to conduct effective information programmes with its constituents and to a broader audience about UN activities. Now, these requirements were repeated word for word in a second signed statement by Paul Hofel dated March 4th, 2004. But this 2004 statement went on to directly address Watchtower's claim that the requirements for association were different in 1992. It said, Please be informed that it is the policy of the Department of Public Information of the United Nations to keep correspondence between the United Nations and NGOs associated with DPI confidential. However, Please see below the paragraph included in all letters sent to NGOs approved for association in 1992. The principal purpose of association of non-governmental organizations with the United Nations Department of Public Information is the re-dissemination of information in order to increase public understanding of the principles, activities, and achievements of the United Nations and its agencies. Consequently, it is important that you should keep us informed about your organization's information program as it relates to the United Nations, including sending us issues of your relevant publications. We are enclosing a brochure on the United Nations and non-governmental organizations, which will give you some information regarding the NGO relationship. In addition, the criteria for NGOs to become associated with DPI include the following, that the NGO share the principles of the UN Charter, operate solely on a not-for-profit basis, have a demonstrated interest in the United Nations issues and a proven ability to reach large or specialized audiences such as educators, media representatives, policymakers, and the business community. 
have the commitment and means to conduct effective information programs about the UN activities by publishing newsletters, bulletins, and pamphlets, organizing conferences, seminars, and roundtables, and enlisting the cooperation of the media. We expect that you will share this information with your concerned colleagues as we are unable to address the scores of duplicate requests regarding the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that are being directed to our offices. Thank you for your interest in the work of the United Nations. Sincerely, Paul Hofel, Chief, NGO Section, Department of Public Information. Two things are clear from this letter. Firstly, a key requirement for joining the UN as an NGO, indeed the principal purpose of association as a United Nations DPI non-governmental organisation, was support for the UN by spreading information about its principles, activities and achievements. Indeed, the name of the arm of the UN that Watchtower was applying to, the Department of Public Information, should surely have been a clue as to what NGO association might involve. Secondly, the UN are unequivocal that NGO association involved sharing the principles of the UN Charter. Interestingly, several quotes in Watchtower literature criticise the UN Charter for having its roots in false religion. The following quote is from Watchtower's authorised history book, Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom. While World War II was still underway in 1942, Jehovah's Witnesses had already discerned from the Bible at Revelation 17.8 that the World Peace Organization would rise again, also that it would fail to bring lasting peace. This was explained by N. H. Noor, then president of the Watchtower Society, in the convention discourse, Peace Can It Last? Boldly, Jehovah's Witnesses proclaimed that view of the developing world situation. On the other hand, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish leaders actually shared in the deliberations in San Francisco in 1945, during which the UN Charter was drafted. To observers of these developments, it was plain who wanted to be a friend of the world, and who was endeavoring to be no part of the world, as Jesus had said would be true of his disciples. The 1984 book Survival into a New Earth contained similar sentiments. The involvement of the churches in politics is well known. When the United Nations Charter was being formulated in 1945, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish delegations were on hand as consultants. In recent years, popes of Rome have lauded the United Nations as the last hope of concord and peace, and the supreme forum of peace and justice. The World Council of Churches, with membership of some 300 religious groups, has even provided funds used to finance political revolutions. Yet Jesus Christ said to the Roman governor Pilate, My kingdom is no part of this world. You have to wonder whether the writers of these publications would have been quite so emphatic about deriding the UN Charter as a product of satanic false worship if they'd known about or anticipated Watchtower's voluntary involvement in supporting it. So, all things considered, the suggestion that there was any ambiguity over the requirements when Watchtower joined in 1992 soon unravels when we examine the United Nations' own official statements. Now, it could be that Paul Hofel, then chief of the UN's NGO section, without any apparent motive, decided to involve himself in an elaborate conspiracy aimed at trapping Watchtower in a compromising situation. It could be that Watchtower are the only ones telling the truth, despite deliberately concealing any information on this matter from ordinary witnesses. But I for one find it more likely that a signed official UN correspondence is accurate and honest in clarifying the requirements Watchtower chose to accept in 1992. Requirements that were clearly in direct conflict with the organization's stated principles and teachings. 
Having dispensed with arguments two and three, this leaves us with the first argument that Watchtower went to all this trouble just so it could get a United Nations library card. This invites the question, do you need to be a United Nations NGO to access UN library materials? To help us answer that question, here is the web page of the Dog Hammerhold Library, the main depository for United Nations documents and publications located at the UN building in New York. Under the FAQ heading, Who May Use the Dog Hammerhold Library? We are told... People with a valid UN Headquarters ground pass may use the library, including staff of the following. UN Secretariat Diplomatic Missions Specialized Agencies Accredited Media Accredited NGO The library is not open to the general public. Our primary clients are the permanent missions of the member states and the UN Secretariat staff. While we aim to answer questions about the UN from external researchers, this is not our primary mandate, and our capacity to do extensive research is limited. The vast majority of recent documentation is available to everyone electronically. Some of the main resources for documents and information are listed below. Members of the public are invited to visit depository libraries located worldwide if they are in need of documentation in hard copy format. So, if you want a piece of information in the Dog Hammerhold Library, all you need to do is find it online. Or, if you're really keen on getting hold of a hard copy, you can visit one of the many depository libraries. You might be wondering, what is a United Nations Depository Library? Well, the same website explains... Since 1946, the Dog Hammerhold Library of the United Nations Secretariat in New York has arranged for the distribution of United Nations documents and publications to users around the world through its depository library system. The general public can consult the material free of charge at any depository library. So, how hard would it have been for a Watchtower researcher to travel to one of these depository libraries? According to the official list of depository libraries, at least as of 2016, there are five of these libraries in New York State, three of which are located in New York City, at Columbia University, New York University, and the New York Public Library. In short, you don't have to register as a UN NGO to get access to the information in the library at the United Nations in New York. The same information is freely shared, both electronically and in hard copy at a number of other libraries, including several that are within easy reach of Watchtower's New York headquarters. So, with all three of Watchtower's excuses evaporating on closer inspection, you might be wondering... What is the real reason why Watchtower did this? Why was it so important for them to become embroiled with the very organisation they were supposed to despise? I suppose you would have to ask Watchtower directly, and good luck with getting an honest answer out of them. But in my view, this whole scandal was likely a product of Watchtower's pursuit of what most religions crave – power and influence. In exchange for sharing information about the UN in their publications, UN NGOs are typically invited to participate in UN conferences, meetings, commemorations and observances. These are all excellent opportunities for organisations like Watchtower to network with governmental bodies and other non-governmental organisations and gain much needed influence and leverage. This policy of rubbing shoulders politically has continued in recent years, with Watchtower on record as sending representatives to conferences of the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, otherwise known as the OSCE. The OSCE is an observer at the United Nations General Assembly, and its chairman in office gives regular briefings to the United Nations Security Council. So, in a way, Watchtower never fully washed its hands of all ties with the scarlet-coloured wild beast.
if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're learning about all this for the first time, you have every right to feel appalled at Watchtower's hypocrisy in this matter. After all, Watchtower demands zero compromise from ordinary witnesses when it comes to remaining untainted by worldly politics. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi were encouraged to suffer beatings and see their homes and property destroyed rather than by a card identifying them as supporting the ruling party in a single party state. There are even reports of some witness women being raped as a result of taking this stand. I intend to cover this shocking episode in Watchtower's history more thoroughly in a future video. The point is Watchtower was under no threat of torture or punitive measures if it failed to register as a UN NGO associate. Rather than take a firm stand for its principles, it pursued close ties with the UN voluntarily. It's also worth remembering that joining an organisation with political aims is interpreted by Watchtower as a breach of Christian neutrality and it can carry serious penalties for ordinary witnesses. The Elder's Manual, Shepherd the Flock of God, has a list of actions that merit disassociation and included in this list on page 112 is the following. Taking a course contrary to the neutral position of the Christian congregation. If he joins a non-neutral organization, he has disassociated himself. If his employment makes him a clear accomplice in non-neutral activities, he should generally be allowed a period of time of up to six months to make an adjustment. If he does not, he has disassociated himself. Unfortunately, most elders who read this will be completely unaware that Watchtower has itself been guilty of making itself an accomplice to an organisation it claims is in direct opposition to God's kingdom. There is much more I could say on this subject, but if nothing else, hopefully I've at least given you a brief overview of this little known aspect of Watchtower's history. If you want to look into this in more detail, there are two resources I'm happy to recommend. Firstly, there is Paul Grundy's excellent jwfacts.com website with its superb write-up on this story. Paul has included quotes from Watchtower publications that were printed during the years that it was a UN NGO associate. These quotes, straight from the horse's mouth, show a clear softening in Watchtower's stance on the United Nations over the period that it was required to write favourably about it. Secondly, there is this booklet by Tammy Dickerson titled Jehovah's Witnesses and the United Nations, How the Watchtower Society Fooled Millions. This explores the story in more detail and includes copious research that completely debunks the excuses offered by Watchtower apologists on this issue. And speaking of apologists, it's worth mentioning a website called jehovahsjudgment.co.uk that has a lengthy section titled The Watchtower Society as a United Nations NGO, a critical look at the conspiracy theory. By all means, examine it and form your own opinions on whether it is an accurate, balanced, well-argued treatment on the subject. I've already dealt with some of the main arguments which, as you would expect, mirror the excuses given by Watchtower, but to save you some time, I highly recommend downloading a free 19-page PDF expose that dismantles all the website's arguments one by one. You can find a link to this PDF in the sidebar of the UN article on jwfacts.com. And if you really want to cut to the chase, there is a useful table on the final page of the PDF that summarises each of the arguments and why they don't hold up to serious scrutiny. Basically, when it comes to this or any of the various scandals or dubious teachings connected to Watchtower, whether it's the mishandling of child abuse or the ludicrous teaching about 607 BCE, all of this ultimately rests on faith. If you're desperate enough to believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are God's one true organisation, you will find reasons to dismiss any information that contradicts that premise. Even if Watchtower is caught red-handed in a secret relationship with the UN, well, it must have been framed by lying opposers as part of some elaborate conspiracy. 
If Watchtower covers over the whole thing and never comes clean about it to ordinary witnesses, well, that too won't matter. Ultimately, you need to decide whether you value evidence and whether you appreciate being led along by an organisation that keeps its followers in the dark and refuses to hold itself to the same standards it imposes on others. I'm Lloyd Evans and I hope you found this video useful. Please subscribe for more videos and thank you for watching.